between 10.30 and now, so <laughs> missed our luck. I uh, hope you all enjoyed your Thanksgiving holiday. Um, we're very glad you chose to come here today. Um, very, what I'm sure is a weekend full of many uh, other things you could be doing. So we're all looking forward to this, this session. I want to just ask a question, though. Um, I do see some new faces. Is this our first time to be for everybody? Oh, well, I'm glad to have you here. Um, and how about, do we have any members in the audience? Thank you all for your membership and support. So for those of you that are newer, the House of the Southern Gables Settlement Association is a nonprofit that owns and operates this two-acre campus that consists of several historic houses, including the most famous one, the House of the Southern Gables, which of course is famous due to Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel that was um, set in the home. A lot of people aren't aware of our history, though, as uh, not only a wealthy sea merchant's house, but also a settlement house. When our founder and Caroline Everton purchased the house in 1908, she restored it and turned it into a museum, uh, not only to celebrate the legacy of the family Hawthorne, but also to earn money to help fund what was called settlement work, work to help immigrants that were settling here in the neighborhood at the turn of the century. And this is work we still do today. So in addition to preserving our historic site, we also provide adult ESL and citizenship classes we have a summer school program for English language learners in elementary schools, and we also offer a um, series of community conversations on the topic of immigration, and, um, which I'll draw your attention to this, because our first um, one for, I guess, in December, we're starting off a series of six conversations uh, called Becoming American, and it will be a film and discussion series uh, based off of PBS documentaries on our immigration experience. So we're really looking forward to those. I think these, they're not, actually I see some spread around. I hope you can all join us for those. Also coming up, we will be part of uh, Christmas in Salem, here in Salem. We're uh, with several house tours around the neighborhood, but our houses will be decorated for Christmas. And if you buy Christmas in Salem tickets, you can see our houses and enjoy some other holiday experiences inside the homes. Um, I'd like to thank um, a few people for making our event today, as well as the rest of your possible. We have Paul Susi from Susi Insurance, as well as Dick and Diane Pappett from Salem Inn. They supported our whole year with a, um, a high level of sponsorship. And then we also have several other uh, donors that make our programming possible. We appreciate any support you can give us, whether it's coming to visit, shop in the store, becoming a member, or contributing to our annual appeal, which is going on right now. So um, thank you very much for your support because we couldn't do what we do without you. Uh, I also want to thank staff members like Julie <laughs> over here. <laughs> that just, um, and Brad and some others that um, really pull this programming together, the refreshments and things like that. Board members, we've got Ken Torino right here. Thanks for joining us, Ken. Uh, we have a fabulous board, so we're grateful for that. And also, of course, we want to thank Carlo DeVito, and I'm going to let Julie introduce um, Carlo as <laughs> our, our speaker today. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Happy holidays and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we are so delighted to have Carlo back here at the House of the Seven Gables. In 2015, we welcomed him to talk about a historical work that he had put out about the wreck of the whale ship Essex which was in perfect timing with a movie that had come out that year, and we were it was such a wonderful um, and engaging uh, event to have him here that we wanted to make sure that we got this author, publisher, and winemaker back here for our 350th anniversary year as well. Originally, we hoped to have Carlo here next weekend for Christmas in Salem, but he'll be enjoying some Florida sunshine instead. Yes. So <laughs> we're delighted to have him here for our annual Thanksgiving weekend lecture that we've been hosting for the past few years now. And a little bit about Mr. DeVito. Our author hails from New York and is the owner of the Hudson Chatham Winery. He blogs about wine in his own blog, East Coast Wineries, and is the editor-at-large for a blog called The Cork Report. So for any of the wine fans in the audience, you can certainly get a little bit of knowledge there. Um, he's written more than 20 books, ranging from how to raise great dogs to how to enjoy great whiskey. And all I'll say is whoever says historians are boring clearly hasn't met Carlo DeVito yet. So. But Carlo, besides those things, also has a passion for some of the classic literary legends and names that you know, names like Dickens, Jane Austen. And you'll be hearing today a little bit about the famed Christmas poem, The Night Before Christmas. We hope that you'll join us in our museum store uh, for both a book signing with Carlo and a small business Saturday. 
Um, Inventing Santa Claus will be for sale. You can get that signed by the author asking questions about whiskey and wine in the process. He'll be more than happy to share any of his knowledge with you. So with that, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Come on. I'm usually told I'm loud enough without a microphone, so I don't want to overwhelm you. Is this good enough for everybody? Yeah. I can, you all, they don't want the back of them, they don't want to hear me anyway. All right, so this is all about, uh, uh, this uh, title was hard come by, I cannot lie. Uh, but the story of this is really kind of fascinating. So let's see if this, uh, if I've learned to work this properly or not. I have, there you go. So this is called uh, Inventing Santa Claus, and this really is about the mystery of who really wrote the night before Christmas. Uh, the night before Christmas is, whether you like it or not, probably the most reprinted poem in the history of mankind at this point. Uh, it has been reprinted in almost every language and uh, is easily the most reprinted line of, uh, poem in the United States and in the English speaking world and is the most readily recited poem uh, written by an American author. That author, however, remains to be figured out who it actually is. I'm going to start with uh, The Night Before Christmas that was illustrated by Catherine Barnes. This was my introduction uh, to the uh, famous Christmas tale. And Catherine Barnes had been an illustrator for the American Greeting Card Company and eventually uh, went to work uh, for a, a book publisher that many of you probably already know as Golden Books. This was a different imprint of Golden Books, but uh, she did about a dozen or a dozen and a half books with uh, Golden Books. And uh, it was a you know, beautifully done uh, piece, and, um, and it was especially, that was my sister and I back in the day when I first uh, got to uh, uh, understand what The Night Before Christmas was all about. And uh, my mother had to hide that copy of that book because... Of course, she and I, in our wonderful holiday spirit, would fight over it, uh, especially who actually, whose it actually was. So it was, a, it was a fraught over book, but it was a very important book in our household, to say the least. So, the talk about Santa Claus. We're going to talk about Santa Claus first, long before we get to the poem. Santa Claus um, is wholly an invention of the Hudson Valley. Um, Santa Claus becomes, um, how do you start that? Santa Claus is obviously St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas of Myrna. Eventually, St. Nicholas is the patron saint of both Albany and New York City in the era when the Dutch ruled New York. Later on, the English would continue that tradition. The person who first wrote about Santa Claus in New York State was a gentleman named Washington Irving, with whom you may be familiar. Irving um, wrote a tongue-in-cheek history of New York in which he and other Americans lambasted both Dutch and English settlers uh, in their tongue-in-cheek history of the region. But he's really one of the people who started the whole Christmas thing, and that includes Dickens, he wrote a, a history of uh, a, a Christmas spent in an old English hall. And it was Dickens who eventually picked up that book and became entranced with the traditions that had been lost in England and began writing Christmas books. So a lot of the Christmas literature that we're familiar with today actually dates back to Washington Irving. That's a picture of young Washington Irving, who was America's first best-selling author. And here is the... Um, History of New York in two uh, volumes by Mr. Irving. That was a really important book. Um, Irving had a very small piece in his book about how Santa Claus rode around the city, uh, landing on rooftops, giving gifts or dispensing gifts to little children. Um, that was uh, in the early 1800s. The poem that preceded The Night Before Christmas is called A Children's Friend, and it is generally regarded as the rough draft of The Night Before Christmas. Um, it's different in a number of ways, but establishes a number of the traditions that you and I know of as Santa Claus. This is how he got to Santa Claus. There's no children in the room. I'm not going to ruin this for anybody. Right? Okay. <laughs> Santa Claus was actually Nicholas, which is a misspelling, by the way. It's not Notolus. It's uh, Nicholas of Myrna, 270. 
uh, a tall, skinny, gaunt man, unlike the Santa Claus that we're familiar with today. Uh, and the Hudson Valley Dutch, it, it, it eventually, from being uh, a St. Nicholas, gets uh, uh, mispronounced into Sinterklaas. And that's how the Dutch start to pronounce Santa Claus. Then the English and the Knickerbockers, the, uh, the, the New Yorkers who were trying to establish an American history, decided to Latinize Santa Claus, and they made it Sante Claus. They thought that this was a much more um, English, erudite way to say Santa Claus. And eventually, by 1810 to 1820, it, the, the local inhabitants of New York, who were maybe not so quite well-educated as the Knickerbockers and the uh, New York Historical Society, start further mispronounced the name to Santa Claus. And that's how you end up with the name Santa Claus. It is not anything that anybody came up with. It's a bastardization of a bastardization of, of a name. So that's how you came up with the name Santa Claus. This is all very important as you start to understand what the poem means. So for anybody who doesn't know, The Night Before Christmas was actually first published in a small town named Troy, New York. Anybody familiar with Troy, New York? There you go. So if you go to Albany and you go east of Albany, it's a small town uh, called Troy, New York. Troy, New York during the Civil War would become much more famous because there was a guy named Uncle Sam who was created in Troy, New York. And that uh, was a huge manufacturing town that provided the U.S. Army with tons of goods in the name U.S. Sam became synonymous with Uncle Sam. That's where, the first to- for the first time, the uh, piece was published. There's a picture of Troy in 1837, so you can see it was already a bustling metropolis. There you go, another lovely uh, view of Troy from back in the day. And this is the office from which it was published. This is the office of the Troy Sentinel. I actually have an office about six doors down from this, so I get to read the plaque there that's every day, etc. But it's a cool little building. There's a little storefront down the bottom from something else, but that was the, uh, the uh, Troy Sentinel. And uh, the poem appeared on Tuesday, December 23rd, 1823. And there you go, it's a broad sheet, and you can see the poem is reprinted right in, right in there. Not much fanfare, not a really big deal. Um, just to give you an idea, the publisher's name was Tuttle, who ran the newspaper. And over the years, which we'll get into later, he couldn't even remember who gave him the poem. The poem was not signed, and um, he assumed later on that it was Clement Seymour, but he actually had no idea. And he couldn't actually remember how the hell he got it. (laughs) So that's kind of interesting. So there's a little close up of how it appeared. Uh, Pretty fascinating when you come to think about how such a major piece of American literature was just kind of like an add in uh, on a Christmas thing. The uh, poem was an instant hit. Uh, The publisher made more money on that single issue than he'd made on any other issue. So uh, over the years, they started printing broadsides of the poem. So all the way up to the 1830s, the publisher reprinted the poem with no name attached. There was no name attached. Nobody had ever claimed uh, ownership of the poem. There was a, began to become a, a, a kind of contest to see who could come up with who the real author was. It was kind of like when Joe Klein wrote Primary Colors. They were, <laughs> in the press, there were all these people positing who it might or might not be. Uh, but this became instantly uh, the most reprinted poem in, in, in America up to that time, of course, in American history. And that brings us to Henry uh, Livingston uh, Jr. Having Henry Livingston Jr. was part of the Livingston family. Anybody familiar with the Livingston family? Well, if you were living in those times, it would be hard not to be. They were the Rockefellers of the 1700s. In the Hudson Valley, the Livingstons owned one million acres. At one point, they could walk out the door of any one of 10 mansions and look up and down the river on both sides, and they owned every acre. Um, All traffic, any boating that went up and down the river on a commercial basis, had to pay a fee to the Livingston family. 
No Livingston worked for 125 years. <laughs> so it's not a bad gig if you can get it. Um, the uh, Livingstons were also pretty smart. Uh, they uh, furthered their economic gains because they funded a small boat named the Claremont, which was actually named after one of the mansions that one of the, uh, that the main uh, branch of the family lived in. And the Claremont uh, became the first operating steamship. And all patents after that were also granted to the Livingstons and to Robert Fulton. So that any steamship had to pay a double fee because you had to pay a license to be a steamship and then you had to pay a license to travel up and down the Hudson Valley. So as I said, you, you really, it was good to be a Livingston. So he owned a small place. We're going to get to it. Uh, his father uh, died and he and his brothers, uh, there was a lot of land up for grabs between he and his brothers. And he got a little place called Locust Grove, which is right down uh, on the water. And uh, I'm being facetious when I say it's a nice little place. Uh, it's a couple hundred acres, prime real estate, over by Poughkeepsie, uh, in, uh, right on the Hudson River. Today, Locust Grove is better known as the residence of Samuel Morse, the man who invented uh, uh, Morse code. Uh, Morse eventually bought the property many, many years later, and it is now a historical site that you can go to. But uh, this was the original home of Henry Livingston Jr. It was a rather large tract of land. He had farm. Um, you know, this, this pictures that we have don't really get across how large this house was. This was a large three-story house with a two-story add-on to it. Really was quite impressive back in the day. So he uh, had a large farm. He was also the mayor and the magistrate of uh, Poughkeepsie for his entire life. So he was a pretty important guy. There were, there were no legislative meetings that happened without him. He decided all manner in the, on the eastern bank of the central Hudson Valley. Uh, he was a pretty big, important guy. And these were some of the other homes that the Livingstons lived in, just to give you an idea of the immense wealth and power that the Livingstons enjoyed. Uh, Claremont was the seat of the, of the largest uh, group of the family, but there were a number of other mansions up and down the Hudson Valley, many of which are uh, historic homes that can be viewed today. And this is uh, the view outside the Claremont house, which was about 20 miles north of his, uh, and is still one of the most popularly visited of all the Livingston mansions. And that gives you an idea of the immense scope of what the Livingstons owned, right? I mean, you just can't even imagine that kind of wealth or, or ownership. So, uh, good news, bad news, um, he was of age to be drafted uh, when, the, when the American um, Revolutionary War came out. And so he served in the Battle of Montreal, which uh, pitted General Guy Carleton uh, versus Robert Montgomery. Uh, funny how that uh, name comes up because Montgomery had married into the Livingston family and is still one of the largest mansions you can see in the Hudson Valley today. Unfortunately, Montgomery didn't make it out alive. Uh, we, uh, we, we secured the outskirts of the city, but uh, Carlton got uh, reinforcements uh, before uh, uh, Montgomery joined the battle for the actual town of Montreal, and uh, the, the Americans suffered a brutal defeat. But uh, Livingston had been a hero in securing the region around the city and was stationed uh, there for many years. He was an average farmer, just like anybody else. He bought and sold barter pigs, lambs, crops, potatoes, corn, uh, anything you can imagine growing. And he fell in love. And so this poem, this letter, uh, begins some of the traces of what we're going to be talking about. He writes, a happy Christmas uh, to my Sally. You see it up at the top uh, right hand, the top left hand corner. And uh, he was very well known for his love of Christmas, and he wrote Happy Christmas many, many times over the course of his life. It was something that he was very fond of. The um, other thing about him was that he had a true love of poetry, and he published many poems. Many of them were either under an initial, they were either under the initial L or R or something like that, and um, as any gentleman of the day who wanted to write poetry, you didn't put it under your own name, 
you put it under a, an anonymous or you signed it with a, an initial that you or some of your friends knew was you but was not a pronounced thing. He published in a number of different journals, including New York Magazine, and so he was a pretty, pretty prolific guy, and he wrote numerous poems, and then he died in 1828. That's an important date for us for, for the short term, but uh, he died in 1828. This is a translation of his will, and there he is. You can still go see his uh, uh, grave marker in Poughkeepsie, still there, didn't move. So that can, that's going to bring us over to the second half of this. This is Benjamin Moore. This is not the guy who founded the paint company. So Benjamin Moore was the first bishop of New York. He was also the uh, pastor of uh, an insignificant church called Trinity uh, Church, which is down in lower Manhattan. It was really the most important single church at that time in the city. Um, Benjamin Moore became somewhat uh, uh, infamous because he refused to uh, grant last rites to uh, Alexander Hamilton after participating in a duel. And uh, eventually he relented and did finally give last rites, but he was a pretty hardcore Tory. He was not a fan of the, of the fight for independence um, etc. He was a hardcore conservative. Oh yeah, he was also the president of Columbia College, the first president of Columbia College. So he's a man of great learning and uh, great accomplishment. He had a rather large house uh, in uh, the city. And there's Trinity Church right down there on, where in Wall Street today, so you, where you can still visit. And there's King's College, as it was called, uh, Columbia College was called back then. And that brings us to a young man named Clement C. Moore. Like Livingston, Henry Livingston Jr., he's born into tremendous uh, uh, wealth and power. Um, his father is the Bishop of New York. He's the pastor of Trinity Church at the president of Columbia College. He is uh, brought up as an academic, like his father. He will eventually become the pastor of Trinity Church. He will also become the president of Columbia College. In the summer, he spent his summers in Elmhurst, New York. Very exciting. Uh, Elmhurst, Queens. I apologize. Elmhurst, Queens. So this was his maternal grandparents' home in uh, Queens. And that park exists today. Um, uh, as we speak, and it's Moore Park, even though that was not the name of the people who lived there. Uh, this was his father's house in New York City, eventually uh, where he grew up, and that's going to be play a major part as we go forward. His first book book was a book called uh, Notes on the State of Virginia. I'm sorry, his first book was a treatise against Thomas Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, Jefferson had written about how to set up a democracy, how to use different... Um, uh, um, uh, texts like the Magna Carta and several of the uh, um, uh, constitutions from the various states uh, and what democracy actually meant. Uh, like his father, Clement Seymour was a hardcore conservative and wrote a treatise against this book, which uh, of course is considered a classic of American literature, uh, but that's who Clement Seymour was. He also, this is a bit of controversy here, uh, entered into a number of the libraries a book on merino sheep. He, did a, he, he claimed to have done a translation of it. Well, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting way to say it. He signed the book saying trans, uh, with his name on it and entered it into several libraries, but he was not the one who actually translated it. In later years, people would argue whether he tried to steal the book and, and, the, and the fame for having translated it, or if it was just a mistake. But it's a very important piece as we get closer down the line. So that's uh, uh, him early, later in life. Now, Clement C. Moore, at the time of his death, was almost more well known for a small thing he did in New York City. He owned a farm. That farm was named <coughs> Chelsea. 
So if you're familiar with the neighborhoods of Manhattan, Chelsea, the, the, the neighborhood in Manhattan, was all of his estate turned into, eventually turned into a uh, living space for the citizens of New York. So it was pretty fascinating. There's a large seminary there, which he founded. He decided to save the last, I think it's two or three acres for himself and set up a very extensive seminary there. But the rest of the town in uh, Chelsea looks like that. And it was very controversial when he did it. He sold it lot by lot. He had an architect, you had to use his architect, and the houses had to look expensive and be expensive. And he made a lot of money doing that because Chelsea's a pretty big neighborhood. Of course, uh, and he also established a new church in the city as well. So he was a pretty happening kind of guy. The funny joke was, though, that the architect who insisted on all these um, fancy new digs uh, himself got, as part of his commission, uh, a side of a block. And so none of his buildings matched the building code that he established for everybody else. And so those, those stores are still there today. Those buildings are still from the 1830s. It's really kind of funny, and the kind of irony. So in his old age, Clement published a book of poems. And this is where it all starts to get really murky. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But he published his book of poems in 1844. And eventually, uh, that's his house, by the way, if you ever want to walk through Chelsea. Um, and you can see his house. And of course, they used his house as the typical Chelsea house, which is kind of funny. Um, he moved to Newport, Rhode Island. Didn't do too bad selling off New York real estate. And uh, had one of the mansions in Rhode Island. And you can still go see his house on tour today. And it's called the Christmas Mansion. There you go. So, and then Moore, uh, of course, died um, later on, much, much, much later on than he was a, he was a generation after uh, Henry Livingston Jr. So, what's fascinating is Clement Moore decides he's going to publish, at the behest of his children, a book of his poems. Like Livingston, he publishes a ton of poetry. And like Livingston, like any good gentleman of the day, especially somebody who's the president of of Columbia College, or the pastor of Trinity Church, he only puts an initial on some of his poems and not on others, very much like Livingston. At one point, he is approached, let's see, if, do I have this in the correct order? Yes. Um, by this editor, a young gentleman named Hoffman. Hoffman publishes the first volume of great American poetry and insists that the night before Christmas has to be in the book. Of course, he, call, he calls on his good friend, Clement C. Moore, because the rumor now is that Moore has written the book. This is 1844. Livingston has been dead uh, 16, 18, 16 years by that point. Uh, actually less, maybe 14 years. Moore says, yeah, you can use the poem. Doesn't have a copy of it. So he has to write to Tuttle to ask if he can get a copy of The Night Before Christmas. And Hoffman puts it in there. Hoffman unwittingly kind of cements Clement C. Moore as the writer of the poem, even though there's no real evidence that he wrote it. So in 1844, he writes to Tuttle and says, has anybody claimed this poem? And Tuttle says, well, no, we, we thought you wrote it. So uh, he says, oh, well, yeah, absolutely. He puts it in his book. <laughs> but the, so it's kind of a, an interesting little thing so now what's really fascinating is that later on in life Clement C. Moore said oh I wrote the poem in no time at all and uh, the poem that you see uh, in, the, in, the news, in, the, in the book today has very little rewrite uh, between then when I first published it in the newspaper and when I put it in my book uh, instead this edition had something like 35 to 40 corrections in it from what had originally appeared in the newspaper, and he made another 30, 40 corrections on it before it went into his book. So that's another kind of like one of those fun moments, but it appears in 1844. Okay, so the National Intelligencer, yes, so this is where it starts to get interesting because people start to question did Moore really write the poem? And he runs around in a number of national newspapers saying, oh, yes. Indeed, I wrote the poem. 
The problem is that he has no corroborating evidence. There is no copy of The Night Before Christmas written in his own hand before 1844. Matter of fact, the first written copy is well after 1844. And uh, the, um, what happens now, it gets even more interesting, is that uh, the authorship starts to get questioned because the Livingston family says, oh no, we heard this poem when we were children. He would recite it to us before we went to bed on Christmas Eve. And so it starts to flare up. Now here in the Christian Science Monitor in the 20s, it becomes an even bigger deal. And uh, this is the American Weekly, which was a big newspaper magazine uh, then, and that it gets brought up again in the 40s. So this is, this kind of starts to lead us into another question, which is kind of fun, is that how does the tall, gaunt St. Nicholas become the fat, chubby guy we know? And the fact of the matter was that Everybody had associated in New York Santa Claus being this small, fat Dutchman, because that's what Clement Seymour said when he got interviewed about the poem 25 years after it had been published. And so you see a number of different um, cartoonists start to take this tact, the most famous of which is Thomas Nast, who, by the way, later on is a very good friend of a guy named Mark Twain. So you start to see Santa Claus go from this gaunt, tall man, but he's originally aimed, and when you read the description of him in the poem, he's a small, short, of, short fat, pipe-smoking Dutchman. A far cry from Nicholas of Mira from 270, who was a tall, gaunt man. The first color editions of the book appear in the 40s and 50s, and again, this shows about how the poem becomes just this runaway train, long without... Clement C. Moore, uh, or um, Moore to, uh, Livingston. And uh, Nast really does become the sort of arbiter of Santa Claus, and it just kind of gets run away. But it becomes part of popular American iconic lore. There's a, now this, I find this fascinating because this is from 18, I think, 79, I think it is. And you can see Santa Claus on the far right top. And our, our really, our visions of Christmas haven't really changed much. And, 150 years or so. So again, this is another one of these copies by Moore writing the poem. But again, they all take place well after he's published his book. And then we get to the modern era. Uh, this man uh, is one of the uh, professors of uh, comparative literature over at um, Bard College, uh, Don Foster. And Don Foster wrote um, a piece in a book of his uh, doing a bunch of uh, literary sleuthing, saying, no, in fact, Clement Seymour didn't write The Night Before Christmas. And how could he say that? Well, number one, if you read the poems of Moore and, uh, and Livingston, Livingston's language and his cadence are all much more like The Night Before Christmas than Clement Seymour. Clement Seymour, just uh, by the way, is as hardcore an academic as you can find. He is, a, he is a translator of Greek and Hebrew literature. Um, his poems are very stilted. Uh, they tend to use very, very set patterns in terms of syllables and line lengths, whereas The Night Before Christmas fluctuates a lot more than what um, uh, uh, Clement C. Moore's poetry did. So he writes this, and he gets all kinds of uh, great headlines, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the whole nine yards. But uh, he gets lambasted for it, by the way. So now there's a huge backlash by all these people who've said, no, 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 Clement Seymour wrote it. But they, they offer no proof. So uh, kind of fascinating in that. Uh, eventually, one publisher eventually publishes a copy of A Night Before Christmas using the name Henry Livingston, Jr. But it's not going to happen, right? Because at this point, uh, the night before Christmas sells a couple million copies every year at Christmas time with Clement Seymour's name on it. And if you're going to look it up on Amazon.com, you're not going to pick up the piece by Henry Livingston. Then you're going to pick up the one by Clement Seymour. It's just a matter of gravitas at this point. But it, it did happen. Whoops, I just turned that off by accident. There you go. It took so long to get it. I know. So if you go to the, uh, the, the uh, 
thing here, the, the, the building, they still have a plaque to Moore uh, there. But what's fascinating is, in Troy, they thought this was so much fun, they decided to have a trial. And so they actually had the uh, district attorney and the, uh, uh, um, and the public defender argue in front of the uh, uh, city uh, court uh, on who actually wrote it. It was a big thing. It was quite a lot of fun, big publicity uh, gap. So I'm going to read off a couple of things here just because I think this is kind of what's interesting and what's not. Oops, I apologize, I lost that page, give me a second. Uh, I'm so sorry, I apologize, I lost my page, it's right here. Oh, here we go. Okay. So, one, no copy of the poem exists in either man's hands that predates the publication in 1823. That's the first thing you need to know about this whole argument. Second, there is a, um, a copy of the poem written in 1825 by hand. That's still two years after the publication of the, of the book that was written by a young woman named Meryl O'Dell, who uh, lived in Montreal. She had a tenuous connection, very, very tenuous connection, to parts of the Moore family, but no direct connection to Moore himself. That is the oldest existing handwritten copy of the poem to date. And it was in neither man's hand. Um, at one point, Tuttle assumed Moore had written it. There was, first he claimed that a housemaid that had worked for Moore eventually brought the poem to him up in Troy. False. No such thing existed. Don't know where that story came from. It was circulated for many years. Not true. Uh, the second one was that a minister who was familiar with Moore, who lived up in Troy, had somehow gotten a copy of the poem Again, you're talking about a handwritten copy, and brought it, uh, and his wife brought it to Tuttle. Again, nothing that we can confirm in any way, shape, or form, and and he did not uh, posit that. Somebody else posited that. Um, neither man ever signed the poem with his initial that they were famous for. Uh, neither man, neither before or after 1823, ever published a poem with the Troy Sentinel, ever. Uh, there was no connection between Livingston and the Troy Sentinel, uh, Sentinel uh, just like there wasn't between Moore. Um, the earliest handwritten copy by Moore is 1853, well, well, well after it was done. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, I already told you that one. Oh, so this is one of my favorites. So I noted that there was Happy Christmas uh, in the poem, in the letter to his wife, uh, Livingston, that he made. In his entire life, Clement Seymour never wrote Happy Christmas, and not in any of his correspondence ever. He considered it bad form. <laughs> kind of interesting for a poem that ends with the line Happy Christmas. <laughs> uh, he, considered it, uh, he considered it uncouth. Um, Livingston was very immersed in the Dutch culture. He grew up in the Hudson Valley, which was still very staunchly D uh, Dutch, despite the fact that the English had taken over the colony. Liv uh, and so you'll see any Dutch references in the, in the poem, which there are many, um, seem fine, because when you have to realize the, uh, the Livingstons, part of their fortune came from the Stuyvesant family, who were Dutch. And even up into the 18, uh, 1940s, most Livingstons were still, still spoke both Dutch and English. On the other hand, Clement Seymour had no real introduction to the Dutch. He remained in a very um, English-influenced uh, uh, world, very Anglo-Saxon-influenced world. And if he had any other influences, they were Greek and, and Hebrew, not Dutch. 
So that was another kind of fascinating special, uh, section because there are a number of references in the poem that are Dutch. For example, all the names of the, of the reindeer are Dutch and German. It's funny because it was Clement C. Moore that changed the Dutch names to German because originally all the names were Dutch in, in the original publishing of the poem. So that's kind of uh, fun. Uh, there was another uh, uh, wave uh, uh, finding against Moore. Uh, a gentleman named McDonald from Australia ran a computer search uh, using uh, various and sundry kinds of ways to compare the poetry of Clement C. Moore using their whole body of work and uh, found that overwhelmingly that the poem much more resembled Livingston's work rather than Clement C. Moore's work. So that was yet another blow against all that. Um, yeah. You know, Livingston never claimed uh, ownership of the poem either. So that's something that Clement C. Moore backers would say, well, he never, but he didn't claim uh, ownership of any of his poetry. And it was only after a bunch of sleuthing by Don Foster and by McDonald that they found more than 100 poems by Livingston in a number of the local newspapers around, around him. But he never claimed any of them. Nor, it was only uh, Clement C. Moore that claimed any of the poems later on in life. Um, I think now, one of my things that I really love, of course, is that Every year around Clement C. Moore's grave, they recite the night before Christmas, which I, uh, which is very touching. It's a fabulous ceremony if you've ever been to it. And of course, if you go to Locust Grove or you go to Claremont uh, in the Hudson Valley, they also recite the poem the night before Christmas. Of course, they give credit to Mr. Livingston, as one might expect. And of course, the fun part of this is that the. The real joy of the poem is that it celebrates Christmas. It's the poem that has established the American version of Christmas, and indeed the one that most of the world, English-speaking world, still um, uh, uh, goes with. Uh, I found it interesting, uh, bought a version of uh, The Night Before Christmas from my two sons, who are now much older than this, and of course they fought over the book as well. So I think the fun part of it is that no matter who wrote it, it's one of those endearing pieces of literature that uh, has grown to be a part of our culture. Um, if you read the poem, uh, and uh, as, as, as I'm sure you all will this, this holiday season, it really set the whole stage and tone for what Christmas is that we know today. And uh, it's a very important piece of American literature. It's been reprinted around the world, and yet no one still knows who actually wrote it. Um, which I find really fascinating. Why Troy? Why the city of Troy did that poem come out? Uh, it makes no sense. And to have two men who never had anything to do with that newspaper suddenly be connected to that poem, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how that works. So that's as best as we know about the night before Christmas, um, except happy Christmas to all and to all of <laughs> you. So I'm sure you have plenty of questions, happy to answer any questions. It's a, I, I really tried to dumb down the story, if you will. There's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, there's a lot of mistaken identity. Uh, there's a lot of arguing. Uh, there's a mad woman up in Wisconsin who's related to the uh, Livingston family, who's very, very nice, but she is adamant that her ancestor get um, uh, uh, right to claim to this book. On the on web, on the law, online, there are very definite and vociferous camps about this <laughs> argument. Uh, the, uh, she has a fabulous website. You can read all the poems of Clement Seymour. You can read all the poems of uh, Livingston, uh, Ju Henry Livingston Jr. Uh, she's got their correspondence up online. She's got everything. It's a very, very fair and balanced representation of what's there. Um, there is another fellow who tracks all this, and he's in the book as well. And he is very staunchly on the side of Clement Seymour, and he's dug up every newspaper article and every 
correspondence that Moore ever had with a newspaper, um, and uh, goes back and forth with a number of this. So, but these camps just, they hate each other, and you're like, wow, it's just a Christmas poem. And uh, my favorite line is, there's a Clement C. Moore the third. This is the second, the third, if you will. And um, the New York Times called him up when all this was going on. He goes, really, do, does anybody really care? He goes, the poem's out there. I, I, you know, you can still, most people can recite the poem. Who cares who wrote it? It's a, just a great American poem. And I thought, here's a guy who's the CEO of a major corporation. He's like, really, there are better things to argue about in the world. But it's a fascinating literary journey. And for anybody who's really uh, into it, it's a really fun story. Because what you realize is that Santa Claus, and again, there's no children in the room, uh, is wholly an invention of this uh, odd pushing together of the English and the Dutch in the Hudson Valley over a 50 to 75 year period. It's a, it's a series of the English poking fun at the Dutch and the Dutch poking fun at the English and this, and how really the working man takes this word Sante Claus and turns it into Santa Claus. And how somebody like Washington Irving and a few other people suddenly take this character and create an indelible character that's now a part of our lives uh, um, uh, on, a, on an annual basis. So it was really kind of fun. So anyway, so did anybody have any questions? I'm sorry. Um, the, the phrase about the stockings were hung by the, uh, by the chimney with care and so on, does, where did that come from? Does, do we have any mentions of stockings? Uh, I mean, shoes, yes, but stockings. Yeah, no, stockings were definitely a part of, uh, of that period. Number one, people hung their stockings to dry is more the thing. But uh, people did hide Christmas presents or small presents in stockings. It was a tradition, not a huge tradition, but it certainly was something that was going on at the time. It was nothing, that, the poem did not invent that. Uh, the poem invented almost everything else about Santa Claus, though. It's interesting how in England they still say they still say, uh, yes, they still say Happy Christmas. I wasn't able to really um, uh, uh, nail down when it got changed to Merry Christmas in a number of, because if you read a bunch of books today, uh, especially the American editions, they all say Merry Christmas. Uh, there was a fabulous site that's still up, and this woman has a copy, oh, a copy of almost every historical version of The Night Before Christmas. So it's a fascinating, I mean, it's just hundreds and hundreds of these uh, uh, photos of the books of the interiors, really fascinating stuff. But yeah, no, it's the uh, it's um, uh, uh, you uh, English versions. Some do have Happy Christmas, so that's kind of interesting. But Moore himself never wrote Happy or Merry Christmas. He considered it an offense to God. He was a very hardcore. He wrote a he wrote a poem. It was a nasty poem about gloves. There was about a woman who he thought was frivolous who wore fancy gloves. So he was a, you know, he had a little different outlook on life than, than I think most folks, I guess. So um, you talked about the derivation of Santa Claus. Uh, what about Chris Kringle? Uh, you know, it's funny. I was going to go off on the Chris Kringle, but I, I did it simply because I really just wanted to stay. My publisher was like, please stay with the poem. It's, it's enough. Um, I can't lie to you. I thought the book would be much shorter when, I, when we started working on it. There's a lot of there there. Uh, I'm not quite sure where Chris Kringle came in. I really, I didn't see that. I mean, the, the whole Santa Claus thing, which uh, I really um, whittled down there. I literally had to sit through an hour and a half program and talk with two uh, Santa Claus of, uh, historians. Uh, and actually, one was a Dutch historian and one a uh, Amer Dutch American historian, and the other guy was a Hudson Valley historian. Um, to to get that to boil that down, it took an hour and a half for them to to explain that. So I was I was you know you kind of get your eyes crossed, but it was uh, it was fascinating. But how some of these names came up were. Uh, kind of crazy, and again with the names of the of the reindeer, they were all in Dutch, and it was Clement C. Moore who changed a bunch of them into German. They were not German. The original, if you read the original poem published in eighteen twenty three, they were all the names were Dutch. Do you happen to know if there's a poem like that in, in the Netherlands? Or 
I, I'm not familiar with it. No, nowhere where I read did that come up. The one that was the most famous or similar was the Children's Friend, which was 1821. And it established, uh, again, a, a, a Santa Claus that flew around with a sleigh and a reindeer. He only had one reindeer. It was the poor version. Um, and he flew around uh, using, very much using the Washington Irving uh, image. And basically, if you were a bad child, it, it was very, um, it was uh, very, uh, oh, how do you say this? It wasn't a friendly poem, in much it was called The Children's Friend. Because basically, it said if you're a bad kid, you're not getting anything for Christmas, so you better be good. That was the whole message of the poem. And then it used the kind of image of Santa Claus as the, as the carrot, as, as you uh, you will. Yes, sir. You hear uh, Father Christmas is used in some English speaking countries. I'm sorry, say that again. Father Christmas? Again, Father, Father Christmas. Christmas didn't come up with uh, in, in the conversation of, of, the, of the poem. Um, really, uh, whoever wrote the poem was much more a fan of Washington Irving than traditional Christmas. And so that's why I have him so prominent up at the front because. Most of the imagery that are in A Children's Friend and The Night Before Christmas are originally established in Washington Irving's history of New York because uh, St. Nicholas was the patron saint of both Albany and, and New York City um, and it kind of just went from there. But do we know Father Christmas came after Santa Claus? Or? Uh, that's a good question. I did not, you know, it's funny. I didn't think that's a good question. That was I did used not more in Britain, Father Christmas. I know, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I apologize. That's a good one. Okay, one last question. Yes. Well, what about Rudolph? When did he come? Oh, Rudolph came much later, in nineteen uh, late nineteen thirties, early nineteen forties. It was actually advertising copy that was written for the May Company, and the idea was that they were trying to get you to come to Lord and Taylor, uh, and so he wrote the story of Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Uh, as ad copy, and it only later became a, a song and then a story. Um, it was uh, it was a completely bass awkward uh, kind of way to have a legend come up, but he was really originally just ad copy written for uh, for that. Yeah, it's fascinating actually. That's a that's a whole book on on itself. Wonderful. Well, just thank you so much for being here tonight. <laughs> Thank you for all of us here.